Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to fall. In a 20 more, 21 more minutes, it'll be the fall season. So I hope you're ready for it. I'm looking forward to a little bit of cooler weather. So we're going to start today talking about programming and why you want to program a stitch. When we look at all of our different decorative stitches that we have in our machines, you have to wonder why you would need more stitches. But there's always reasons that you can use more stitches and especially make different decorative techniques. So we're going to cover a few different ones. First of all, I'm going to show you this now, but we'll come back to this later. The um, I'm going to switch over my camera here so you can see here. I'm going to show you how you can make your own scalloped binding. Now, this is a stitch you can make in programming. And all of our machines can use programming. If you go back 25 years, we've been able to uh, program our machines. On uh, the Opal 690 that I'm in front of right now, if I wanted to program, I'm going to look for where it says PROG. And all of our older machines, like the Designer SE, the Diamonds, the Rubies, they all refer to programming. And you can find out how to do it by going to PROG. In the newer machines we actually have changed the symbol a little bit and uh you'll you'll see that in a minute i'm going to show you what how that works but i started making this scallop binding by using programming and i actually make quite a few different stitches in programming and combine them in different ways too the uh the this kind of technique is not just for quilt binding though you could use it on the edge of a garment you can use it in a lot of different ways so we're going to go right to the machines and you're going to see how you can program in stitches. And if you've never done it before, it really makes a big difference when you get a little bit of confidence and you know you can use it because you can bring in stitches and make changes to them and combine them together to create brand new stitches, which I think is phenomenal. So we're going to go over and right now we're in front of the uh, Sapphire 85, which is a sewing and embroidery combination machine and when i'm here if i'm looking at a stitch and i touch a stitch like for example i'm going to go to menu k and i'm going to choose the stitch so if you don't go to programming if you just choose a stitch you will get that exact same stitch again and again and again but that's not how these stitches were meant to be used these stitches were meant to be put together to create different types of new stitches. So the symbol for stitch for programming on our newer machines is the A and the zigzag. You'll see it right down here on the bottom. And that would be the same on the Epic and the Epic 2, the Ruby 90, the Brilliance 80, all of those machines, they have that A and the zigzag to, pro, uh, to signify programming. Now, hold on one second here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that same stitch just to give you an idea of how you can use that. Programming is meant to be very easy. It's not difficult. It's just that we don't think about using it. So I'm going to choose that same. Let me zoom in here a little bit so you can see it. Wait a second here. All right. So there is the same flower. And I'm going to add a leaf to it. The last stitch comes in and it's the darker blue color. If you don't like something, you touch the trash can and you delete it. This time I'm going to choose a different leaf. So now I have a flower and a leaf. And I can scroll back and forth to see what I've got. And if this time, if all I wanted was that flower and a leaf, then I could add in my selective thread cutter and it would sew those two stitches together and then stop and cut. I'm going to make a different pattern though. I'm going to duplicate that leaf and I'm going to mirror image it top to bottom. And then I'm going to put that flower in again because I'm making a nice little pattern. So the flower needs to go the other way. So I'm going to mirror image it. And then I'm going to touch the selective thread cutter and now it will stitch out that pattern. So when you're looking at the way this would stitch out, this would be your pattern right to here. And I love the idea that we can kind of put these different combinations together. And I'm gonna, I've stitched them out in a couple of different ways for you to see. Hold on a second here. 
here's another one that I did. And this time we have that one pattern and then I rotated and turned and kept going around the corner. Now, the nice thing about all of these stitches are if you wanted to save them and keep them so you can use them again or use them in embroidery. Whoops, let me just get back here. Well, it's wrong way out here. All right, hold on. To save a stitch, you go down to the heart and then you can name it what you want to name it. So if I was to call this, I don't know, let's just call it FLP for the fun of it. But I could name it or I could put it into a folder and now it is saved on there. These stitches, the way that I've made them in programming can just as easily be made in embroidery for those of you that have an embroidery machine. If I was to go to embroidery, that program symbol is right there on the bottom, just like it was in sewing. Or if you've made the stitch and save it, then you can go up. Wait a second here. And I save that stitch somewhere. Let's go down and see where I've saved it. These are all stitches that I've saved. And I called the original one flower leaves. So I'm going to touch, touch that and load it. So now that is ready to set up in embroidery. I'm going to make my hoop a little bit bigger. It doesn't need to be that big. Let's go with this one. All right. So I have one design. I could make a whole row of them by just touching duplicate and make a line of stitches. Or I could rotate it and put them together to make a frame. So Everything you're doing with your decorative stitches. Now I've got it set together. I can go into here into my layers and I can combine them. And now that is a grouping. That's all together combined. So I'm just going to check and see if I have any questions before I go any farther. All righty. So there is, um, they did want me to remind you not to click on any links. If you see any links, anybody asking for credit cards or anything like that, or any links that are not from us, there's nothing like that that we're going to post. So please don't touch any of them. Uh, I believe that there's a, a little bit of spam coming in there. So please, you can comment any way you want to, but please don't click on any of the spam links, okay? And you might not recognize it as spam, but you'll, you'll click on it and you'll find out soon enough. So... When I'm over there on my machine, I'm going to zoom in so you can see how fun that stitch is to see it when you've made a frame with it. So for those of you that have an embroidery machine, you can create your stitches and then bring them into your embroidery screen and play with them. And that's the nice thing about uh, sometimes you, you don't know exactly what you're going to do with them. So it gives you a chance to play with them. I'm going to come here for a second. So here's another example of that exact same set of stitching. So I put this on a dish towel and it turned out pretty cute. What I did was I hooped my fabric, I brought those stitches in and I laid them out so that they filled my 360 by 200 hoop. And when I did that, then I just pressed the start button and I chose monochrome, meaning it wouldn't stop for different color changes. And it stitched the whole thing all at once. It took about maybe three, four minutes to stitch it. Because they're, they're sewing stitches, they don't take a long time to do this. So there are all kinds of machines that can do this. The machines that can bring your sewing stitches into embroidery would be your Rubies and your Diamonds, your Brilliance 80, the Sapphire 85Q, the Ruby 90, the Epics. The ones that can't, maybe that would have been a better list to make, right? So the ones that cannot bring sewing stitches into embroidery are the Topaz 50 and the other Topazes. They don't have the ability to, to bring stitches into embroidery, but they still have a lot of beautiful stitches, right? So when we look at our decorative stitches, we can think about how we might want to combine them together and put them up there. So right now I'll go and I'm going to show you some other stitches that you can put together because there's a lot of different ways you can use them. But 
even if you go back to uh, designer SE, you were able to bring in your decorative stitches into your sewing, uh, from sewing into embroidery just that easily, okay? So we're going to go back over and I'm going to look at some different kind of combinations of stitches so you can kind of see and get your creative juices going. And then I've got a few other project ideas that we're going to, um, I think, help kind of give you that motivation to give programming a try. So on our, remember we were talking about our um, opal here. If we go to programming, not only do we program, we can also program in alphabets, right? So we can choose letters. I can type in my name. I've got some letters in there now, so I'm just going to delete them. And I can type in my name by selecting a letter. And I can put in anybody's name. I can go down, scroll down, and go to the different letters. And I can also use the arrow keys like this and go up and down like that. So programming, you have a little bit of a smaller screen, but all most all of our sewing machines can program in stitches. When you're looking at uh, programming in stitches, all the opals can. You can even go back 20 years to when we had our lilies and our sapphires and platinums. All of our sewing machines can program in decorative stitches. The only ones that really can't are the emeralds. And if you go back a million years to the daisies, mechanical machines, you cannot program in. But if you've got an electronic machine, no matter how old it is, pretty much you're going to be able to program in decorative stitches. And I'm going to switch back over. All right. And right now I'm in embroidery. I'm going to go back to sewing. And we're going to choose a different stitch. Now, I always go down and start in my programming mode. So I touch the program. And this time we're going to go and look at some kid stitches. And I can zoom in if anybody needs to zoom in. Let's see what we've got here. We've got all these fun stitches. And I think when we're looking in here, this is what we're going to go and do. All right. So I'm going to zoom in so you can see a little better. All right. Now what I'm going to start with is a train. We have this little train. And I can put another couple of different trains. I could put some different ones. And if I want to, I can put multiple ones. And then I can go back to the caboose and mirror image the caboose. And now when I want to stitch that out, it will give me that combination. Now, because I didn't program in a stop, it will just keep sewing. It's not going to stop. It will just keep sewing. So if I go over here to my machine, all right, and I want to come down. Now, I should have my B foot on, but I'm just going to give you a start and show you. It automatically will go from one stitch to the other. And if I want to touch the stop button, it will stop at the end of that repeat that I of stitches that I put in. So right now, that's the end of the repeat of stitches. And I'll show you what that looks like. So there's some decorative stitches of the trains. All right. They're not. Wait a second. Let me see if I can get better in the light here. So they uh, right now I used uh, just a regular thread. I didn't make the contrast very great. But you can see how quickly we're not meant to spend a long time programming. We can go in here very easily and select the stitches that we want to use and program them. Like, see this little balloon in here? We have lots of fun balloons, lots of fun creative things that are in here, kites, all kinds of really good ones. Let me see if I touch that. So that this is, whoops, a pretty balloon. All right. But maybe I'd like to make a balloon where I can have a longer tail to it. So I might like the balloon the way it is. I'm going to go to programming. I'm going to go to that menu of stitches. And let me touch that little balloon. And now I'm going to go back to my D menu where I have all my quilting stitches. All right. And now look at that. Now I've got an extra long tail to it. 
So we don't have to necessarily accept the stitches the way that they are. We can change them and adapt them. And when it comes to making this scallop border, I want to show you how we're going to do this scallop border. Okay, so I'm going to delete the stitches that are in programming. And to make this stitch, it's actually very, very easy. We use the open toe foot. I'm going to choose the left straight stitch. That means the needle is in the left position, and you'll see why in a minute. And I'm going to shorten the stitch length because I'm going to end up turning the tension up. So I'm going to shorten the stitch length, and I'm adding six or seven stitches. Let's say I've added that. As you're going, the stitch length is 16 millimeters, and every stitch is two. So that means right now I have eight stitches in there, so I'll just delete one of them. And now I'm going to go and get a satin stitch, which is a stitch number 12. When it comes up, the stitch length of that is 0.8. I'm going to shorten it up a little bit, all right? I'm going to bring it down. To zero, that means it's not going to move ahead, right? It's going to stitch in the same place, left and right. And I'm going to duplicate that twice. And now I've just made my scallop stitch. And when I'm sewing this, you really will be surprised the way that this works. So I'm working with the open toe foot. Wait a second, let me get the foot in front of the machine here. And when you're sewing a stitch like this, you can use all different fabrics, but I personally like to use a fabric that's cut on the bias. You're going to get better results if you cut this on the bias. Now, this fabric that I've used is a really fun one. It's got a creative stripe to it. And when I was testing this out, I decided to starch it to see if I like that better. And when you're doing binding that's like this, Starch is not actually going to work very well for you because the starch makes your fabric so stiff that it's not easy to get that pulled look that we're looking for. You can see that scallop look here. So what we're going to do is um, if you are making bias binding, you're going to get the best results. And here's my binding. I cut it three inches wide instead of two and a half, which I normally do. I'm going to fold the binding in half, and I just finger press a fold in there. Now, why it's important to use the open toe foot is that you don't want to have the bar across the foot controlling the fabric. Every time it's going to stitch, it's going to stitch forward, and then it's going to come and take a bite off the fabric come back and take a bite off the fabric. And every time it takes the bite off the fabric, that is when your fabric is going to pull in and to give you that nice little groove. So watch when I start sewing here, all right? And the last thing that I need to do, if I don't do anything right now, if I just do this stitch the way that it is, there's my pull. All right, now it's pulling off and pulling in, but it's not pulling as much as I want to. And if I look at the stitch, you can see it's just got a little bit of a scallop to it. So what that tells me is that I need to increase the tension. And when you look at our where our tension is on our machine, when you make decorative stitches, our machine assumes that you want to make a heavy decorative stitch. And so it drops the tension very, very low. We're going to bring this up. Now, a regular sewing tension is 4.6. But for this project and this technique, we want to go even higher. We're going to make our tension go up to, let's put it up around 7. All right. There we go. We've got it at seven. Let me see if anybody has any questions first before I keep going. All right. We're well, no questions. I'll keep going. All right. Now, we're back at our machine. 
Now this time you're going to see quite a bit of a difference. When I start sewing, the fold, you'll notice the fold that's right there, right? The fold is inside the foot of that open toe foot. If you have the fold so that it is underneath the right side of the foot, then you cannot stitch on it. You need the needle to come off past the fold. And I'm just going to go. I'm going to do a little bit and show you, okay? And I like to get a little bit of speed up, too. I think that's enough for you to get the idea. So there is my scallop. Isn't that pretty? So what you're ending up with is a finished edge that's got the scallop. Now I did the thread in blue so that you could really see the stitching of it. But if I was doing this on a quilt where I didn't want to see that, then I would match my thread color to my fabric. Yeah, let me see. I think let me I think you can see that stitch. Okay. Is that coming in clear enough for you? And what it's doing is as it's stitching, you're going to have like five or six straight stitches that come straight down. And then you're going to have the satin stitch that goes right off the edge and back, right off the edge and back. I'll remake this for you again so you can kind of see how I did it. Now that you're paying attention, it is, um, and, and really, as you start playing around, there's nothing, I did not starch this fabric. All I did was I cut the fabric on the bias. I cut it a half an inch wider than I normally would. You can use invisible thread for this, but I don't recommend it. Honestly, remember how I had to turn the tension up because the tension helped the, the scallop pull in. So invisible thread tends to be uh, a little more brittle and it puts a lot of stress on that. So you're, you're asking for trouble as far as I'm concerned. I would use a polyester thread that matches your fabric. And when you do that and it matches your fabric, it'll disappear and you won't see it. And it'll be much stronger for you in the long run. So I'm going to show you how you can put this on to um, a quilt. So this is like a little wall hanging that I have. I just pre-stitched this on the back to give you an idea how to do this. So I've sewn it on the back and I've used, I've checked out my seam allowance, right? When I've sewn this on, when I bring this to the front and wrap it to the front, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to stitch. Do you see the straight line? I'm going to stitch on that straight line and there it won't add a new set of stitching. When I go, I'm going to sew straight down and that stitch on the back will bury itself in the, in the body of your garment that you're working with or your quilt. So it won't show here. It's just going to disappear. So on the back, use the same color thread that's your backing fabric. And on the front, use the same color thread that you see on your uh, binding okay so uh when i did this one here you you can see that it's going around the curve and anytime you're going around a curve you do need to use a bias binding but it's even more so true when you're going to do something like this with a specialty technique and i really think it kind of shows up pretty well and i think you can kind of see it and don't worry, if you forget it, you can always watch this video again. The more contrast you have between your fabric and the binding, the better you're going to be able to see that scallop. So if I had used a color that was the same color as the white, it would be disappearing. And this is an example of something I did that with. All right. So I did that same bias binding technique on here. But you don't really see it very well because you've got that blue border. So it really kind of disappears. It really doesn't make it worthwhile to see. Um, so if you're going to go to all this trouble, then you should uh, make an effort to 
choose something, a color that's very different. Now, if you wanted to, and I had an example of that. Where did I? Hold on a second here. Here's a fabric that I had that had stripes to it. So if you can get fabric that's got stripes to it, that the stripes are on the bias and that you can buy that, then you can kind of set it up. So right now, the way this would get sewn on, it would get sewn on to your piece and it would look like you've added an extra set of fabric in there, right? Because the straight stitch, you would set it up so it would go right where the different color is and it would look like you pieced something, but you really didn't. That being said, you could also sew two pieces of fabric together and have a, a light and a dark and give it contrast. And then that way, what would happen is the scallop that you're looking at would look like it's a different color and the binding would look like it was a completely different color altogether just by having those two colorations in there. It gives you a really different look. Does anybody have any questions about that? I've... Um, Got a couple of other things we're going to go back and program in some different decorative stitches. But if you do have questions, just let me know and I'll make sure to come back to them um, as we go forward. OK, so the the idea with programming is it's not just simply putting two different stitches together or five different stitches together. It's making stitches that you can actually use to get a better effect for what you're doing. I make a hand applique stitch by combining in and it, it makes it look like it's a hand applique but really it's done on the machine and all i've done for that is put in four little short straight stitches and then one zigzag i'm going to show you something else you can do for sewing on handles and working with our directional stitches that many of you just don't realize you have it's perfect for sewing patches onto things and I think you'll really uh, be surprised at how easy this is to do. So I'm going to go back over to my machine. Oh, let's do it on this one here. All right. And we're going to go back to programming. There we go. Let me see if I can zoom out a little bit. There you go. All right. So to go back to programming. Now, if I wanted to remember... If I wanted to save that stitch, when I save that stitch, I want to actually change the tension of it because when I go to save that stitch and call it something, it will remember everything that I did. It will remember the fact that I changed the tension. When I go to reload it, it will bring it back and it will keep that change. And I don't have to guess at what I did. Now, this time, we're going to go and look at the stitches in the T menu. Many of you have machines that have stitches that have the T menu, the S, S menu and the T menu. These are directional stitches that you can move left or right. The way you know if you've got these stitches is if you have stitches that are omnimotion stitches, meaning wider than seven millimeters, then you've likely got this menu of S and T stitches that are side motion stitches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to touch one of them. So, for example, right now, if I have the sideways motion stitch, uh, stitch checked, when I start sewing, my machine is going to start sewing sideways. Now, I'm not in programming yet, right? All I did was just touch the side motion, and my material is sewing sideways. If I change that to go down, now my machine will go and sew forward. So when you talk about directional stitches, you can choose which direction you want to sew them at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to program in those stitches to sew a handle in place. I'm going to go down to my programming button. That's the A and the zigzag. And I'm going to choose menu T. Now, menu T has got two parts of it. The, the top part is a single straight stitch, and the bottom part is a reinforced stitch. I'm going to just do the single stitch just to save us time. All right, so I'm choosing that. And I'm going to come down and say that I want to sew down, straight down, six times. So I'm going to touch. All right. 
My stitch length is short, it's 2.0, and my length of that is 12 millimeters. Now, I want to sew sideways, so I'm going to touch this and hopefully sew the same amount sideways. And now I'm going to go back up, and I'm creating a square. And then I'm going to go to the right. All right, now as I do that, oh, I can see I went too far. So I'm going to delete that. Now I want to come down diagonally. And then I'm going to go back up. And I hope you all can see this really well. Let me see if I can come in there. What I'm making is a box that I'm going to use, oops, too far, that I'm going to use to sew a handle on. Okay? So. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to program in a cut. So I'm going to touch the selective thread cutter, and it's going to cut at the end of that pattern. Now, the nice thing about this is if I was making a bag, now you can see it shows you the one pattern repeat and then the selective thread cutter. Now we're going to go over to my machine, and I'm going to set up the camera so that you can see. And let's pretend we were going to sew a handle in place. Now, obviously, the handle is uh, a little bit wider than what it needs to be, right? So this time, we should be putting on our S-foot. It tells us to put on the S-foot because these are side motion stitches, and the S-foot is the side motion foot. So let me put that in place. All right. Now, if the nice thing about sewing a handle is, remember how I made that? I started on the right, and then I went down, and then over to the left. But every single one of these patterns is going to stay exactly the same because I programmed it in. And so if I use the start-stop button, it'll just go, or I can use my foot pedal. I'm going to use my foot pedal. So it's sewing down, across, over. Then it goes diagonally, and then it stops and does that automatic cut, all right? So there I am, and I'm going to come over to the camera and show you, okay? So obviously, it made a very, very small square with the angles cut into it. This is the kind of thing that you could make as big as you want to, by, I use six stitches. So if I knew that my fabric was two inches, I could add 12 stitches. And then I would go to the left 12 stitches back up. And then I would know each one of those was exactly identical so that I could make sure that my handles were sewn on the same way. Now that is really strong. It's not going anywhere. Even though it's, it's quite small, you can see how small it is there. I think you can see it there. The fact that it was done like that and that each one of those would look the same will give you a kind of a really cool effect when you're going to go and sew on your handles. So I could have made it much, much bigger, but I just wanted to give you the idea that using those side motion stitches, really, if you were sewing a patch on a, a an elbow, right? Now, you don't have to program them in. You could go in and you could just sew down until you want to turn. But the advantage of doing something like this is most of the time, if you're going to repair pants like a, a denim jeans or legs or an elbow, it's really hard to get in there. You don't have a lot of room to move the material around. And if you know that you've got a couple of patches to make, you can make them all the same size, decide what you want them to be, make your fabric bigger, do the, the whole shape that you want, and then trim the fabric afterwards. There's, uh, it's not just handles. There's all kinds of different things like that that you can use when it comes to programming. So I'm not seeing many questions. Does anybody have any questions about programming before I go any farther? I want to make sure that you have that sense. It's pretty easy, right? A matter of just choosing a stitch and then adding another stitch and deciding what you want to do with it. This is not complicated stuff. And if you're not using programming, you're really missing out because it is, it is super easy to do. And you can really get exactly the look that you want. I'll also use this a lot when I want to do something 
where I want to remember the changes that I've made. Maybe I'm using a blanket stitch where I've changed the length and width of it and the tension and I've added a, a stop and some different things into it. Well, by programming it, then I know that it will, I can go back to it anytime I want to. So I'm not seeing any questions. So I'm going to keep going. And uh, you just stop me if you feel like you've got a question, all right, that we're, that makes sense for you to, to uh, talk about. Now, when we look at these Omnimotion stitches, there are some machines that don't have Omnimotion stitches. They would be uh, the Sapphire, I don't think the Sapphire 930 or the Topazes have the Omnimotion stitches. There is, um, there is a Sapphire, I think it's 8. 75 does have the omni motion so it just depends upon your machine and if you um try them out right just select your stitch you're going to know if it is a, a stitch that's wider than seven millimeters it's going to tell you to put the s foot on if your machine did not come with an s foot then you don't have side motion stitches so it's pretty easy to figure that out but that doesn't mean you can't do programming right everybody can do programming so um, somebody asked, can you explain how, again, how you um, did the number of stitches related to the size you want to? And, and absolutely, I'll go back over there. And it's actually kind of easy because it tells you how long that is. And then another question is, what would be the best to program a stitch series in sewing mode versus embroidery? Well, I like to program in a sewing stitches in sewing so I can test it out. So that way I don't have to put fabric in the hoop. I can just do that combination. And then when I know that I like it, then I'll save it. I can still go back into embroidery and program that in, but I don't have to. So uh, there was a question from uh, somebody about, is this programmed in the designer one? Do you, okay. So you you're making it a lot more complicated than it needs to be. For whoever asked about my sonnet, this is nothing to do with my sonnet. This is sewing stitches on your machine. And all of our machines can do this. Every machine going back to the Lilies 25 years ago and the designer one and the SE and um, the one plus, we have been able to program our stitches for 25 years. But nobody thinks of doing it. It's built into your machine. If you have a Husqvarna Viking, as long as you don't have one of the emeralds, which is a mechanical machine, everybody can program in stitches. The uh, My samples are um, stitched on a marine vinyl because I like to do that so that you don't see any dirty fingerprints and things like that. And it just, just makes them nice and stiff. And you can do this type of thing, right? Uh, think about adding some stitches and make a placemat and just add in rows of decorative stitches and play around with them. Uh, that's what I do when all of my stitches, like here I've got some of my sequin stitches. So I like to see what they're going to look like. So all I do is I stitch them out. Now here's some applique stitches. Let's go. We're going to go to an applique stitch and I'm going to show you how you can program in some applique stitches to get different looks to them. And I hope on the screen that it comes in clear enough that you can see it. But let me go. And if anybody has some questions in the meantime, I'll be back in a second, okay? Please show one more time so we can get all of it. You want to see the, uh, which do you want to see, Meredith? And uh, I'll go back and show you. So remember, this is not just for one thing, right? If, if you go and you use programming just to do the one thing I did, you may have lots of better ideas of stitch combinations you might like to do. This is the marine. The question about the marine vinyl. This is marine vinyl that they make the boat seat covers from. I got it from uh, Joann's, but there's a lot of different levels out there, and it's it's pretty thick. You can see, and I used it on the back also, so it's really nice and sturdy. Our machines can handle so much thickness, so never worry about that. And the only thing you might need to do is put on the non-slip foot if you're like stitching on the edge. If you feel the foot is sticking to the vinyl, then your machine will tell you to put on the H foot, which is the foot for, um, it's a non-slip foot, so it doesn't stick to the um, to the vinyl as you're sewing. I'm going to go back over, and we're going to do some more programming. 
Because remember, this is the beginning. This is not the end, right? We have so many different things that we can do in programming. And I'm just kind of giving you a couple of ideas of how you can use it to really improve the quality of your sewing. Okay. I'll show you how I made the scalloped edge again and then how to use the directional stitches. And uh, I'll make sure to cover both of those things now that I got your attention. Because, you know, you don't really realize how important it is until you start to see something and think, oh, I love that. I want to do it. But remember, this video is being recorded. So you can go back as many times as you want to and rewatch it. This time when I'm doing it, I'll make sure to show you so that you can um, keep it in, in your memory as you were doing it. But don't worry about taking notes because the video is there for you to come back to. And you can watch it 100 times if you want to. I know you probably won't, but... You know, just remember that that's there for you to refresh your memory if you need it, okay? All right, so we're going back over to our Sapphire 85, which is the machine that I'm stitching on today. And you can see that design that's there. Now, one of the questions was, how do you tell how big the design is, right? Remember I said the stitch length of was 12 millimeters? Well, here it's showing me that is a perfect square. 12 millimeters long by 12 millimeters wide. And if I wanted to go back and edit it, there is an edit button that will bring me back to that stitch so that I can make changes to it. I'm going to delete it, though. I'm going to just touch the trash. All right. I'm going to go and show you one more combination, just for the fun of it, of how our stitches are meant to be put together. If I go to my K menu, no, my L menu, these are all my applique stitches, all right? Now, some of them, they don't need anything. They, they look nice the way they are. But look at this leaf. Like, what would I do with a leaf like that? It doesn't look very interesting, does it? So it would only be fun is if I had a flower to go with my leaf. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a flower, and then I'm going to choose a leaf. So now I have that pattern, a flower and a leaf. If I wanted it to stop at the end of that pattern, I would touch the um, selective thread cutter. Or if I want to do this as a combination, then I can touch the start button and, and just start sewing. And this is what I just made was that pattern. Flower and a leaf, a flower and a leaf. I hope that comes in clear enough for you guys to see. And... There are so many stitches that are built into our machine that are meant to do that. But when you look at them by themselves, you may not realize that. Like maybe I've got this mouse here. I want to program in a mouse, but I don't want, I'm just going to get rid of that. I'm going to go back to programming, the A and the zigzag, and I'm going to choose a mouse. And then maybe I'm going to do these little balls and I can see what they look like. I don't like the way they join up. So then I'll try and mirror image it. Oh, look at that. That's so much prettier. So now when I go to stitch out the mouse, I have the mouse with a couple of little balls. And then it will bring me another mouse. And it will kind of keep the combination going. So there are thousands and thousands of different combinations you can do. This is what the mouse looks like just by itself. The mouse never looks good stitched on a black fabric. It's much nicer if you use him stitched on a light fabric and then use black thread because you'll really see the shape of the applique mouse. So I'm gonna go back to programming and we're gonna program in that scallop one more time. Remember our lovely scallop here? There's the scallop. Now, the straight stitching in between, I can decide how long I want that to be. I went to my straight stitch, my A menu, right? And I chose the needle position in the left, the far left. When we are in our straight stitch, most of our machines have a multiples of straight stitches. You have a straight stitch in the left needle position, the center position, and the far right. If your machine does not have that built into it, you can always do it by moving your needle position down here on the bottom where the width button is. You can move the needle left or right anywhere you want to. So that's a personal choice as you're doing that, okay? Now, 
I have one stitch. That stitch is 2.5. If I leave it at 2.5, then the stitches that are stitching down between the scallop, that will kind of pucker the fabric a little bit because remember, we're going to turn the tension up. So I shorten my stitch length to 2.0. And now I'm going to choose duplicate to get the rest of my stitches. So that way I don't have to choose and uh, change every stitch individually. So I'm going to touch the duplicate one, two, three, four, five times. Or instead of just touching duplicate once, if I touch and hold, it'll pop up and let me say how many stitches I want to add. So this time I'm going to add seven stitches. And then when I touch the check mark, it will have added seven stitches in there. And that means the total. Right now, my stitch length of that is 16 millimeters. Maybe I want to change it. I'm going to add one more. And now it is 18. There isn't a right or a wrong. It kind of depends upon your fabric. And it depends upon what you're doing this with. If you're doing it on a garment or a little girl's dress, you might want something a little more delicate looking. Now I need the stitches to go straight across. So I'm going to go to my menu B, which is my applique stitches. Some of your applique stitches on an opal, you would find them in your first menu. And on like an opal 690, it's stitch number 35 in menu one. But you can recognize a satin stitch because it looks like a very, very heavy filled in stitch. That's a straight line going across and back. I choose number 12 because it's the widest. When I look at my width of my stitch, it tells me it's six millimeters. Now, because I want to gather that fabric and my needle might not always want to come off the fabric if I make that stitch too narrow, I can make that stitch wider. I can make it seven millimeters. So then I know that I'm going to have a nice deep scallop. On an Epic 2 or a 90, um, an epic 95Q, you can go to nine millimeters with these stitches and you can get an even bigger scallop if you want to. Now, what I, what I don't want is it for that scallop stitch. It goes straight across, down, straight across. I don't want it to move forward. I want it to stitch in the same place. So I'm going to change the length of that stitch to zero. And now I want to do that two more times because the first time when I go... To, for the needle to come off the fabric and come back, it only pulls it in a little bit. Every time I do that scallop stitch, the, the satin stitch, it will gather more. So I'm going to touch duplicate twice more. So now I have three satin stitches. And now when I press the check mark, it doesn't look like much of a stitch, does it? It's only because you know what's in there that it you know what it's going to look like. But if you just look at the stitch, it doesn't look like much. It looks like it's almost like a blanket stitch, right? So here's my fabric. And we're going to see, because I made this one a little bit different. The one thing that I didn't do, do you remember what that one thing is? I didn't change the tension. So I've got to go and change the tension and bring it up so that it will allow me to pull the fabric in and i've got one more thing after this so don't go anywhere all right so i'm going to start back in here again and let me put this down a little bit so you can see it better all right so remember when you're doing this you don't want to sew off you don't want any fabric underneath the right of the foot it's got to be, the fold has got to be floating free and the needle has to be able to sew off the edge. So I'm going to come forward. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. Now the faster I sew, the more the machine will tighten the thread and give you a better scallop. So I'm just going to go a little faster. Now. Remember I said I needed to change the tension? Well, I didn't because I wanted you to see. It gives you a little bit of a scallop, but it's not really pulling the fabric in. You really, the important part of this message is you have to remember to increase your tension. So this time I'm going from a 2.4 and I'm going to go up. 
let's go up to a 6.4, which is quite high. You'll see a big difference. See how much prettier that is. Now you'll notice the scallop, the scallops are longer because I added an extra stitch in here. So now in between that satin stitch, it goes a longer way. The original ones that I did way back here, they were shorter because I only added six stitches to it. But it's a personal preference. There is no right or wrong. It's what you like. But once you get the way you like it, then save that stitch and name it with the changes, whatever that stitch is, decide how you want to do it, okay? Now, there's another stitch that's very similar to that that I made using this beading. This is a beaded piping. There's actually beads in here, and I made it very, very similar to the way that I made that scallop binding. And it was, again, it was a programmed in stitch. What was important that I was using four millimeter beads and so that the satin stitch had to fall in between where the beads were. So when I originally did that, let me come back. I'm just going to come back here and see a little bit. When I originally did this, I tried it at four millimeters. So I add, added two stitches, right? One that was two millimeters and another one that was two millimeters. And what happened was, that the thread was landing on the bead. So that showed me that I needed to make that stitch longer. So when I did it, I made the first stitch two millimeters, the second stitch 2.5 millimeters. And then when I sewed it out, the it was just perfect. So what I did was I took that same type of uh, bias binding and I cut it two inches wide and I used the piping foot, the original, uh, it's a welting foot as it's called actually. And I put the beads right inside of the fabric. And I just stitched a straight stitch right next to the beads. And then afterwards, I used the beading foot and came back in and did the decorative stitch over the beads. Now, you don't, if you've got a machine that has the blog to it, the instructions are already written in the blog. So uh, I'm going to show you where you can find that. And if there's anybody that doesn't have uh, the a blog or have the access to the blog and you would like to have that information, I'll copy it and put it in a post in, in the, um, the Facebook Live after it's done so that you have it. But I do want to show you where you can find it for those of you that have the blog because it's pretty incredible that we have this stuff. These blogs have project ideas and ways of using your not only programming but all kinds of different sewing techniques that are built right into your machine and sometimes we forget to look at it so let's go look at the blog so i can show you where you can find that information if you're interested in doing the the um isn't that weird hold on a second here did the wrong camera there you go all right so i'm going to go back to our main screen our main home screen and the blog shows up at the top so uh whether you're on an epic or an epic 2 it might be a little different or a brilliance 80 but if i touch that here you have choices of what kinds of sewing do you want to see do you want to see sewing embroidery i want to look just for my sewing projects and so if i scroll down you'll see these are all sewing this is a really cute spider with Halloween coming up, you might be interested in this. And this shows you how you can go into programming and program in that spider design. And look at it, it's got a long stitch. It looks like kind of like a spider web. There's all kinds of different things in here where they're talking about using programming. The one that is the one I did is this one. And it talks about what you need. Oh, that's a button bracelet. Didn't go far enough here. Maybe I went too far. There it is wrong one. All right. So it'll tell you, you need four millimeter beads. You need the clear metal piping foot and you need the mini bead foot. And then it tells you how wide to cut the bias. All the information is right there for you. And then it tells you how to go into programming to make the stitch. 
So you will find in the blog all kinds of great projects in there that are really set up for you to be able to uh, practice your programming and do different things with it. So it's, it's the kind of thing that sometimes we forget that it's there. But it is amazing when you start playing about how you can think about, um, like, for example, the applique stitch that I use. I love to do machine applique. And I used to use the blanket stitch that was built in, which is basically three straight stitches, and then it'll come and take a bite from the side. And I shortened it up so that it was really, really tiny, but there was a lot of extra stitches in there. So instead, now I make my own stitch in programming. I'll add two stitches at a 2.0, and then I'm going to take that little bite with a zigzag that goes straight over, and then... I shorten that, narrow that down to about 1.0, and then that I have a beautiful applique stitch that I can do that it really, you, when you look at it, you can't tell the difference between a hand applique and a machine applique once you start doing that kind of stuff. So we're almost out of time. Is there anything anybody wants me to go over and show them again or any questions that anybody has? I hope you've enjoyed it and that you try programming your machines and make sure to come back and uh, try it again because that whenever you have one of these Facebook Lives, if you go in sometime in the next few days and give it a try, it'll stay with you and you're going to use it much more often. So I hope you've had fun. I hope you enjoyed spending this time with me. And uh, if there's no more questions, then I'll probably say goodbye. Remember, it's happy fall. Remember to smile. The leaves are changing here in Vermont. It's absolutely gorgeous. And um, I'm so lucky that I get to enjoy it. And I'm back on the road next week. So it'll be fun to see people across the country. So have a wonderful week, everybody. And thank you for joining me for this time and give programming a try. You won't be sorry. Bye-bye.